It is an honor to introduce our invited speaker for this fall's Stein Lecture. Although this is our first ever virtual Stein Lecture, this seminar, history, this seminar series has a long history in the Department of Economics at Vanderbilt University. It was established in 1978 to honor the memory of David Stein, a professor of business administration at Vanderbilt from 1951 until his death in 1976. Professor Stein was a gifted teacher who took special interest in his students. He was also a successful entrepreneur, uh, a practitioner of business finance, a patron of the arts, and a prominent civic leader in Nashville. The lectureship has been endowed through the generosity of the Stein family and Professor Stein's friends, colleagues, and business associates. We are particularly grateful to have Professor Stein's sons, Ronnie and David, uh, here with us today for this seminar. Today, Vanderbilt continues a long tradition, tradition of hosting some of the most eminent economists of our time through the Stein Lecture Series. Our speaker today, Professor David Card, is the class of 1950 Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, Director of the Labor Studies Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research, President-elect of the American Economic Association, and one of the profession's foremost labor economists. Over his 42 year career, his research has fundamentally shaped how we view the economics of immigration, wages, inequality, education, and gender and race related differences in the labor market. Professor Card received his bachelor's degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, and his PhD from Princeton University. Prior to joining the faculty at Berkeley, he previously taught at the University of Chicago and Princeton and has held visiting appointments at Columbia, Harvard, and the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. To characterize Professor Card's writing as prolific is a gross understatement. He is the author of five books and over 125 published journal articles, many of which are among the most highly cited articles in the history of the profession. It is not surprising then that Professor Card has also been asked to serve in a wide range of leadership positions within our, prof within our profession. For example, Professor Card has previously acted as the co-editor of Econometrica and the American Economic Review, two of the leading journals in economics. His research contributions have been further recognized through many of the profession's top awards. In 1995, he received the American Economic Association Association's John Bates Clark Prize, which is awarded every other year to the economist under 40 whose work is judged to have made the most significant contribution to the field. He was a co-recipient of the IZA Labor Economics Award in 2006, the Frisch Medal by the Econometric Society in 2007, and the BBVA Frontiers of Knowledge Prize in 2015. On behalf of the Department of Economics and Vanderbilt University, we are very glad to welcome Professor David Card as this fall's speaker in the Stein Lecture Series. Please note that audience members can submit questions for Professor Card through the Q&A feature throughout the talk. We will leave time to address as many of those questions as possible at the end of the talk. Thank you again, Professor Card. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Joel, for that very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Which I hope is working. Does that look OK? I'm assuming this is all right. Yes. <laughs> OK, thanks. 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 Joel. Uh, uh, all right. So um, this is my uh, my lecture is entitled, Are We Underinvest Underinvesting in Education? This is, uh, I'm very uh, grateful for the invitation to give the Stein Lecture. Uh, special thanks to uh, Ronnie and David Stein for being here. I, as someone who's been in, uh, working at universities for many, many years, I know just how important it is to have um, the long support of uh, alumni and alumni families and how much uh, institutions rely on that support and how important it is to uh, all of us to have um, that help uh, to make the next generation able to benefit like previous generations have. Um, before I go on, I, I say that this, uh, this lecture is dedicated in the memory of my old um, friend and colleague, Alan Kruger, 
um, who, uh, with whom I worked a lot on many different topics, uh, including uh, work on uh, education. And Alan, I will be mentioning some of Alan's work uh, as we go on, uh, was a major contributor uh, to some of the most important new strands of work on, on understanding the investment in education. So I'm going to try and give a, a relatively quick um, overview of a very uh, huge literature in economics and other social sciences on the question of um, how much investment are we doing in education and is it the right amount or not enough or potentially too much. And uh, I'm going to take a kind of a mixed perspective on that. I'm going to present varieties of different kinds of perspectives on that. Um, I've found in the past that the, the one way to try and um, communicate some of the things that I want people to focus on is to take a slightly broader view and think about how we view the United States and higher education and how that view has changed or not changed as the facts have changed. So I think most people are aware that up in the period after World War II, the United States was really um, in a leading position in the world. We had uh, some of the most important science, the most important scientific discoveries, the most important companies. Um, and we were kind of leading the world in, in a, a pace, a, a steps toward a kind of a, the, the way that the world looks today. So after the war, we had the highest share of high school graduates, uh, nearly the highest share in the whole world, and by far the highest share of uh, people with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and those education advances um, really carried on. So from 1945 until about 1970, there was an amazing period of growth uh, in education in the United States. And um, that led to a, what's now I think viewed as a golden age for growth in incomes and upward mobility. And what I'm gonna argue today is that um, sometime in the 1970s, we really faltered. And that faltering has really continued since then. So it's quite a long time, uh, actually a longer period of, of hesitation and faltering than actually the, the period of growth. And so here's a, a, a prelude to that an uh, argument. Let's look at the fraction of men born in different years who completed college. And I'm going to be using the phrase a cohort. A cohort means, the way I'm going to use that to mean is people who were born in the same year. And let's focus to begin with on people born between 1910 and 1990. Um, 1910, my grandfather was born in 1896. So this is a little bit before he was born. My youngest grandmother was born in 1920. So this is in between my grandparents' generations. And here's a graph that some people may have thought about or seen. This is showing the fraction of men in the US, native born, uh, who had completed college. Um, and this is based on retrospective data from different sources. And you can see and on the x-axis, I have the year of birth of that, those men. So people born in 1910, men in the United States born then, had about 10% of them had a bachelor's degree, which is pretty remarkable when you think back. More than 100 years ago, even then, 10% of US people had a, a bachelor's degree. By 19, people born in 1950, which is just a little ahead of me, uh, we were up to 30%. So in that period, that short 40 years, we increased the fraction of people with a bachelor's degree from 10% to about 30%, which was an amazing pace of growth and uh, really showed um, uh, a remarkable commitment on the part of the US to getting more and more people to college and, and uh, successfully um, making that transition, say, from high school to college. So what happened after that? Well, here's the graph that shows the, the, the continuation. Um, and you can see that after people born in 1950, for example, people born in 1960 actually had a lower fraction of bachelor's degree than people born in 1950. And it really wasn't until people born in the late 80s that we caught back up to where we were with people born in 1950. So, uh, the way I've shown this graph here, you can see that if we think of people born in 1990, now those are people that are just now 30, let's say. Uh, so they're finished their education uh, and hopefully have moved into a, a you know, pretty serious stage of their career development. And if they 
had continued on, if, if things had continued on in the way had they had continued, or had been moving for this pre-1950 cohort, we would have seen something close to 60% of them having a bachelor's degree instead of just under 40. So there's about a 20 percentage point shortfall. And uh, that's what I'm going to say is a first indicator of this uh, really serious shortfall in where we were relative to where you might have thought we were would be if you were an observer in the 70s or 80s. Uh, and even as late as the as late 80s, early 90s, I think many people thought that the US was going to get back on trend fairly quickly. And that, as you can see from this graph, that really hasn't happened. What about for women? Well, for women, uh, the story is uh, somewhat similar, not as bad. Uh, so the red line shows the fraction of women with a bachelor's degree. And there's a couple of interesting features of this that uh, we'll come back and talk about over the course of the, of the lecture. One of them is that women historically were behind men in terms of getting a bachelor's degree. Uh, so the men and women born in the 1930s or 40s, which would be my parents' generation, uh, there was about a 10 percentage point lower fraction of women than men who had a bachelor's degree. And then you can see that women started to really make gains relative to men by the time we're looking at women born in the 40s and uh, crossed over uh, relative to men. And today women are much ahead of, of men. And that's manifest uh, anybody who's studied higher education or walked around a college campus, most college campuses will see that there's more women than men. Uh, and that's a, a fact that's true, not just in the US, but in many, many countries. So today, uh, over 60% of all the graduates uh, of bachelor's degree program are female in the US. But you can also see that relative to that really good trend, the women, women in the US also fell behind men, or fell, fell behind the historical trend. So both of them are off the line where, where, where you might have thought they would be. Okay, so that leads to kind of a question, what went wrong? for those people born after 1950 who would have been going to college in the 1970s. So I like to call this what went wrong in the 70s. Uh, people of my age will remember uh, that there was a lot of things that went wrong in the 70s. There was some pretty bad haircuts, uh, some pretty bad outfits, a lot of polyester, um, some music that uh, once in a while <laughs> you hear at a wedding, uh, but hopefully not too often. Anyway, so what went wrong in the 70s? What caused this reversal? And I, I want to highlight a couple of factors. Factor number one was the baby boom, coupled with a halt in higher education investment. And in preparing this lecture, I, I remembered a paper, something I'd read years before, and I went back and looked at a book written by a, a former administrator at Berkeley named Earl Chait. And he wrote in 1971, a very prescient book, The New Depression in Higher Ed. Uh, and he argued that uh, the, the higher education system was going to enter a really serious financial uh, meltdown and that that was going to lead to uh, extreme crowding because the baby boom was com still continuing to come through college and yet there was no more money. So looking at the baby boom, this is a picture of the baby boom. This is a number of births per year by year of birth. Uh, and you can see that in the 19th 30s, there was a decline in the number of births in the US. That was the effect of the Great Depression, a well known drop in fertility. Uh, then, between, say, 1940 something and uh, 1960, there was an amazing resurgence of births. So we go from around um, under 3 million to close to 4 million births at the peak. And then, of course, a, a slowdown again, uh, and, and then a, a, a ripple. So you see this very big rise in the number of young people in the, uh, going to be entering the education system uh, born between 1940 and 1950. We're going to see uh, something like 33% more of these kids. And if we're going to keep up, with uh, increasing the fraction of these people who get a bachelor's degree would, would have required a very substantial increase in investment. So what actually happened? Well, here's another graph. On the, um, on the uh, red line is the number of 22 year olds. So now what I'm doing is I'm showing the data, not by year of birth, but by 22 years later so that people, people born at the very peak of the baby boom in 1957, 
which is very close to my year of birth. Um, we're at the very peak of the baby boom and we're reaching age 22 in 1978 or 79. So that's the very peak uh, there in the terms of the number. And then the blue line is the number of BAs produced in the US as a whole. And you can see a couple of things. So if we go from 1960 to 1970, we see a, a very steady increase in the number of 22 year olds reflecting this uh, surge from the baby boom. And we see even faster growth in the number of BAs produced, which was pretty interesting. And that was this period of a continued growth in a uh, fraction of kids who have a BA. And then around 1971 or two, we see two things. The number of kids is continuing to rise, just as Earl Chait said it would, but the number of BAs conferred actually stalls out and really doesn't catch up uh, until uh, in the 1980s. So what was, what was going on? Well, part of it was crowding. Part of it is that there were so many kids and a slowdown in, in, in a, or relative slowdown in investment relative to the increase in the number of kids. And the best guess from some research by uh, John Bound and Sarah Turner says that that roughly 20% population growth between 1950 and 1957 itself led to about a seven percentage point drop in BA rate per kid. Uh, so this crowding effect was having a, uh, uh, basically causing a, a shortage of slots. And there's a nice graph. This is uh, something that Earl Chait didn't live to see, but I did. I managed to look at the data on just in California. So this is a graph showing the number of BAs produced in California. And you can see, uh, uh, this is on a log scale to make the graph nice and linear. You can see that in the period from 1955 to around 1973 or four, there's a very steady trend, about almost 8% a year increase in the number of BAs produced per year, which is an amazing accomplishment. That's the big growth of the University of California system. And then in 1974, it basically flattens out and we're not that far above that even today. So we kind of reached a kind of a point sometime in the seventies and really haven't gone uh, anywhere uh, very far above that point. Uh, recently, there's been some um, uh, some small gains, but we're still nowhere near the kind of trend that you might have expected if you looked at this if you'd looked at this data at the time that Chai wrote his book in the mid early 70s. Okay, another factor that went wrong for men was that women were going to college and they weren't expanding the number of slots. So, as women go to college, that kind of crowded out men. It looks like. You, we saw before some indications in the for people born in the uh, period from going to college in the 1959 to 60. So these are people born in the 30s uh, and 40s, early 40s. There, about a third of the degrees went to women. Um, by 1979 or 80, it was very close to half. So that's basically when I was finishing my undergrad degree. And today, I, I said it's around 60 percent. So if we hold constant the number of slots in university. And uh, now there's a lot more women going to university, the men are gonna get crowded out. So in order to accommodate that, we would have had to have some rise. What are the implications of this wrong turn in the 70s? One implication is that current levels of education in the economy are far below the trend that you would have predicted. So something like minus two years of average education for current 30 year olds relative to where we thought we would be if our kind of post-war trends had continued. And those lo those losses, in my opinion, have had large causal effects on income, health, and on the economy as a whole. You can see one of the really interesting implications of that is if the previous generation is less educated, that means the parents of the next generation are less educated. So here's a graph. This is the average years of completed education. This isn't no longer college. This is just overall average years of education. So born in 1905, the average person had around nine years of schooling, which is just one year of high school. By 1950, the average person had around 13 years of schooling, which is one year of college. Up into 1990, we were up around just a little over 13. You can see this amazing stagnation starting for people born in the 1950s. And in this metric, you can see women and men look a little, a little more similar than they did in just the BA metric. How does that translate then to the next generation? Well, here's a graph showing average parental education for children. 
by year of birth of the child. So you can see that if you were the children born in the 50s were experiencing steadily improving parents. And as everyone knows who's um, been around the education system for a long time will know there's really only one surefire way to have a better life and that's to have a better parent. And it's very difficult uh, to overcome disadvantages uh, caused by say less educated parents. And so relative to the trend that we would have expected for this earlier generation, children born after around 1980 are not keeping up. And today, say children born in 2008, that's as far as I can push this graph forward, there were about one and a half years less educated parents than you would have thought. And that's gonna have long run impl implications uh, for these people who are now the people that we're seeing in university. Okay, now, so I'm, I'm claiming that there, we're under investing in education relative to where we should be. And I just wanna point out that not everybody believes that. So many uh, non-Berkeley economists um, believe that a lot of the things we see in the education system reflect student demand rather than the supply side, which I've been emphasizing here, the idea that there's some kind of constraints in the slots. And so how do we distinguish that? Well, student demand, according to this kind of logic, is driven by students' perception that if they get a college degree, they'll be able to enjoy, say, higher incomes, better health, uh, and so on. So usually the way that we measure the benefit of a college degree, being economists and thinking of everything as having a money metric, is to measure the wage gap between college grads and high school grads. So the, this college wage gap is a, I'm going to use a proportional number. So it says what percentage higher is the average earnings of college graduates than high school graduates. And the underinvestment hypothesis says, actually, we're not producing enough college graduates. They're going to be in short supply. So they're, that's going to push up the returns to college. It's going to look like the returns to college are quite high because not, a, not enough of them are being produced and employers are competing for them. The demand driven theory says the reason why no one's getting or not as many people are getting education as we would hope is because there's low returns and they're and people are being discouraged from making that investment. And every once in a while, you'll see something in the newspaper, uh, which I have to say drives me crazy, uh, where someone will say, well, the return to education isn't really that high anymore. So let's take a look. This is the college high school earnings gap uh, by year from 1975 to 2017. And I'm showing separately for women and men, and it's a percentage scale or a logarithmic scale. So 45 means 45 percentage points. It means 45 log points actually, so it's bigger than percentage points. And you can see that what happened is, think about the, the timing. In the, around 1970, we stopped producing, we started stopped the trend in increasing the number of bachelor's degree uh, students graduating. And just around that time or shortly after, the return to education starts to rise. So the return to education rising means the labor market is telling us there's a shortage of college graduates relative to other education levels. And you can see that has continued and the rise, the rise was really quite remarkable between say 1980 and 1995, but it's been, there's been some rise uh, even since then. And then just to, by way of perspective, there's a, a 65 log point difference in 2017 between females with a bachelor's degree and females with a college degree. And I'm being very strict here. I'm just saying you have a bachelor's degree, nothing more than that. So I'm throwing away the master's degrees and PhDs. That's a 91% difference. So that's a huge, um, the, the, the economic system is trying to tell us something. <laughs> There's a huge reward to getting a college degree. Uh, another check that people uh, sometimes look at is what's going on in terms of the uh, local labor market. So uh, my colleague Enrico Moretti has a series of studies looking at the contribution of higher educated workers to the labor market as a whole. And he showed in some pretty important work back in the early 2000s that um, earnings are higher for all the workers in a city when there's a higher fraction of college workers in that city. And it really 
clear example of that would be a city like San Jose, uh, close to where I live, where the, there's an amazingly high fraction of people with a high education and very productive, very high wages. And Enrico's interpretation, uh, and one I think that has been borne out in, uh, in other work, is that this more educated workforce enhances the productivity of all the workers in the area, kind of a spillover effect. Uh, this was an idea that actually uh, Enrico credits to Alfred Marshall. And here's what the data looks like today. So this is the uh, on the this is data. Each of these points is a, a commute zone, which is a set of counties around a major city center. So I've got Arlington, Virginia, San Francisco, Boston, Newark, uh, San Jose, highlighted here, and a few other places. Um, and I'm showing the local wage premium relative to the national average against the share of college-educated workers in that commute zone. And you can see, for instance, San Francisco and San Jose, close to 45 or 50 percent of all the workers in those cities are um, have a college degree or more, and average earnings are about 40 percent higher than the national average. And this is a very strong systematic relationship, suggesting that again the labor market is really rewarding. Uh, and telling us something about the benefits of education. And I should remind you that this local wage premium I'm estimating here controls for an individual's own education. So this is the extra reward beyond the reward that you yourself receive from higher education. This is the, in some sense, the area-wide wage premium. Okay. So today, 10 percentage points more college grads in a commuting zone is associated with about 8% higher wages, holding constant individual characteristics. And this correlation has been rising uh, over time, suggesting, uh, in my view, that one of the benefits of higher education is a spillover to other people, and that if we had more highly educated people, we could have more cities that were closer to the San Jose standard and less in the, in the left-hand side of that graph before. Okay, a third way to check the underinvestment hypothesis is to do international comparisons. Um, international comparisons are less salient in the US than in other countries. I grew up in Canada. Uh, I can say that for a Canadian, the number one thing that you would think about if you said, are we doing the right thing? Well, at least until recently, would be to look at the US and say, okay, how are we doing relative to the US? Uh, how's our education system doing? How's our income growth doing? How's our unemployment rate doing? And there's a very long tradition of that. I think there's use in that. There, there's some cautions in comparing across countries, but I think there's use in that. Let's take a look. So here's data for uh, recent data. This is from 2018 data uh, across different countries on the share of um, 25 to 34 year olds, so relatively young people finishing education mostly and uh, starting their careers and the fraction with a bachelor's degree or plus, that's the, the column on the right, or the fraction with junior college or, or more um, in the middle. And at the bottom, I've shown the numbers for the US. So now we have about 40% of these young workers have a bachelor's degree or plus. Remember, if they had been born in 1950, it would have been uh, around 33%. So we've grown a little bit since then, but not very much, at least for men. Uh, another 10 percentage points have um, a junior college or more. So we've got 50% have junior college or more and 40% have a BA or more. And you can compare that to um, different countries. I've highlighted a couple that are of interest. So we're about the same as Australia. Um, a, Similar to the to Canada in terms of BAs, uh, quite a bit below Canada in terms of junior college. Canada has a much more extensive uh, community college, junior college uh, system that's um, contributing a lot to education system there. We're um, about the same BAs as Japan. Again, considerably below in terms of junior college relative to Japan. Um, we're really looking bad compared to, say, Korea and the Netherlands in terms of both bachelor's degrees and junior college or more. So the U.S. is no longer a world leader, the world leader in higher education. It's kind of um, in the middle of the uh, richer higher income countries pack. And the one at the bottom is my favorite because uh, when I was a kid and actually even into my years as a graduate student, I spent some time in England. And at that time, England was, or the United Kingdom, was really very poorly educated relative to Canada and the United States. And they've made amazing progress. So in, in the UK, around 44% of people have a bachelor's degree, which is higher than the US. And 51% have a junior college or more, which is about the same as the US. So if you had told somebody in 1980 that there will soon be a time when education levels in Britain are the same as they are in the United States, people would have thought that was impossible. 
Okay, so with that background, then I'm going to go on to my second part. What can we do about this? What I'm I'm going to assert that we're under investing. Uh, so what can we do to try and get more uh, highly educated people through the system? Well, I think there's two obvious ideas. One is to increase the availability of higher quality college slots, and the other is to improve K-12 schooling and college readiness. And I think we have to acknowledge, just like I acknowledged with the idea of supply constraints versus demand driving the, the shortfalls in education, that there are a lot of economists who believe that uh, input-based policies, i.e. spending more on higher education or on K-12 education, won't work. And there's a lot of different uh, ways or arguments that those uh, critics raise. Two of the main ones are these. One is that kids on the margin won't succeed. So the, the, the kid who is currently not going to get a bachelor's degree in the US can't really succeed. They're just not smart enough. They're not motivated enough. They're, there's some, something kind of holding them back. And we could try and give them a slot in a higher education system, but that won't work. They're going to drop out. Now, the, the comparisons with other international comparisons belie that because lots of other countries are able to do it. But this is sort of a, a, a standard notion. Another one is that spending money in, in education doesn't work because it's very ineffective. You can put money in a, a university or a high school or even a K-8 uh, school, and it doesn't really improve things very much. OK, so in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to try and convince you that that the growing body of evidence suggests that both of those hypotheses are false. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try and argue that input-based policies do work and that kids on the margin, those who are stopping at one level but could potentially go to the next level in the education system, in many, many cases benefit at least as much as other kids who have already made that transition. So the kids who are being held back for a variety of reasons are not held back because they wouldn't benefit. Okay, setting the stage for that, uh, there's a long history of debate in the US about um, school resources mattering going back to the 1960s, a famous uh, study by Coleman and others now widely called the Coleman Report showed that there was little correlation between school resources and student test scores. And that general view has had a huge impact on education policy in the United States. Um, I mentioned or described here Eric Kanyashek, uh, one of the leaders of this idea that um, there's school resources don't matter very much. Um, and that view led to a lot of education changes in the 90s that um, I think 80s and 90s that was uh, that was uh, sort of saying, well, we we don't really need to invest in education because putting more money in education doesn't matter. Now, I think in the 1990s, there was a switch. And I think since the 1990s, the, the things have really started to change and push the evidence very clearly in the direction of the opposite. Um, it's a couple of things that happened. One is the increasing recognition in labor economics that we had to have um, designs. We had to have uh, research projects based on things like a real experiment. Uh, or a very convincing uh, natural experiment or quasi experimental setting that could try and cut through all the underlying forces and really identify the effect of extra resources. And a really important uh, breakthrough here was Alan Kruger's 1997 paper, reanalyzing the STAR experiment. And STAR was a, a, one of the first large scale experiments done in education and it was done in Tennessee. Uh, and this was a project that, um, reduced class sizes in first through third grades uh, and was analyzed and Allen's work showed uh, clearly uh, sh suggest that the results of STAR showed effects of um, these smaller classes on test scores, not huge effects, but reasonable effects by third grade. But there was a concern, a couple of concerns about STAR. One was that it didn't look like these test score effects persisted very much. So by ninth grade, they had um, fallen quite a bit. What, what has now been established is two things. One thing that uh, has been established is that 
um, excuse me, is that um, innovations and interventions and lower level grades can often have short term effects on test scores, not particularly long and persistent effects five or six years later on student test scores, but large effects on things like do kids go to college, do kids um, stay out of crime, do kids earn more. So there's an increasing recognition that interventions at early grades can have an effect that isn't mediated through long run effects on test scores. It seems to be mediated through something other than what we can measure with their test scores at 12th grade. Uh, and James Heckman and others have argued that these are uh, possibly mediated through non-cognitive skills, skills like um, grit and um, uh, attentiveness and stick to and so on. Skills that actually are very, very important in the labor market and for success, but aren't necessarily measured by standard IQ type tests. And this kind of view is uh, now, I think, increasingly accepted. Uh, a second thing that's happened following this sort of new research designs is that a series of well-designed studies uh, looking at very specific kinds of interventions in school resources. So I mentioned here two of these. One is a study by uh, Jackson, Johnson, and Persico, which looks at court-ordered funding reforms. So during the 1990s, there were a lot of states 80s and 90s, there were a lot of states where uh, the courts decided that the state had to spend more money on schools in uh, under-resourced areas. And so many, many states went from having relatively modest equalization programs to having fairly extensive equalization programs, which tried to um, mitigate the lack of resources in a given district, say the property taxes in a, a poorer district wouldn't be able to support very good schools by providing state funds. And they show that those uh, programs had large effects on education and wages, especially for disadvantaged kids, some minorities and low income kids. And a, um, a follow on and closely related study by La Fortune, Rothstein and Schanzenbach studies uh, statewide changes in funding formulas. So they aren't necessarily the um, court ordered funding formula changes, but these are uh, pretty big in many cases uh, funding reforms that lead to, again, a general pattern of spending more resources on uh, schools in lower resourced areas. And they show that those interventions had large effects on test score outcomes for kids in low income districts. A third study that I really like because I uh, have spent some time in, in Los Angeles and saw some of the uh, what they were talking about directly. In the 19, um, uh, early 19, 2000s, there was a big program in Los Angeles to build new high schools. Los Angeles, like many other large urban districts, had let their school systems deteriorate. And La Fortuna and Schanholzer have a study of 150 new schools that were built in uh, various parts of Los Angeles. And they show that these new schools had big effects on test scores, student effort, and local housing prices. So all the kind of reactions that you would hope would be associated with um, an improved education system. And this is an interesting kind of spending because this isn't just spending on, say, uh, smaller class size. This is spending on physical resources. Um, OK, so what else have we learned? Uh, on the higher education front, I think we've learned a couple of really important lessons. And one of those lessons uh, that I'm going to talk through a little bit detail in my last part of my talk here is that admission to a better college leads to higher graduation rates and higher earnings, particularly for disadvantaged students. Now, when I'm talking about admission to a better college, I don't necessarily mean like going from, um, say, Berkeley to Harvard. Uh, what I mean by going for better college would be like going from um, a relatively modest conventional state school to an elite state school. Um, and here's some of the evidence that uh, that is supportive of that. So um, Zachary Bleemer, who's a uh, PhD student at, at Berkeley, has a study of a program in California called eligibility in a local context. This is a, a percent plan that was conducted in California where the top 4% of kids in each high school were uh, automatically given 
entry to four of the UCs, uh, UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis, and UC Irvine, if their GPAs were among the top 4% of their um, classmates. And this is an interesting intervention because these are kids that have good GPAs, but not particularly good test scores. And those kids would not get in to the top uh, UC schools and would normally have to go either to the lowest ranked UC schools like Riverside or to a Cal State or in some cases even to a community college. And this program then says, okay, we know that relative to other people in your school, you've done really well. You haven't done particularly well in this SATs and it's gonna put them into these four fairly elite UCs. And what he shows is that the, this is a, a, a classic kind of uh, research design setting that economists are using a lot these days. If you're in the top 4%, you're in. If you're in the fifth percent, you're out. So you don't get the benefit unless you make the four, top 4%. Setting up a very credible research design, he shows that these barely eligible kids, the ones just on the fourth or third percent, they have 20% higher graduation rate going to San Diego, Santa Barbara, Davis, or Irvine than they do from the kind of alternative set of schools they would have gone to, which is, I said before, was a combination of lower ranked Cal States, uh, in some cases, the uh, lowest ranked UCs and uh, community colleges. And he shows that these benefits are even larger for kids from the most disadvantaged high schools. So not only do the kids benefit from getting access to these uh, better UCs, but the benefits are largest for the kids from the least disadvantaged high schools who would be the furthest out of the money under the ordinary admission system. Uh, Black, Denning, and Rothstein have a very similar type of study looking at the Texas 10% plan. And what they show there is that high GPA kids from disadvantaged schools are gonna be admitted under the Texas 10% plan to UT Austin and relative to a counterfactual where in the absence of the 10% plan, they would be going to a lower ranked um, Texas school or possibly a community college. And they show that the kids who get in under the 10% plan, so they're in the top 10% of their cohort at their high school and not the 11th or 12th or 13th percent, they have higher graduation rates and higher earnings, very similar to what Bleemer's study shows in the UC context. Now, both of these studies show something very interesting and, and a, I think an important lesson, which is an important metric of the kind of quality of the school you're going to is the graduation rate of entering freshmen. And this is kind of a boring in, inside number. Uh, people in higher ed know these numbers or know how important they are, but it, it hasn't really attracted, I think, quite enough attention. And uh, here at the bottom of this slide, I'm showing a, couple, a few numbers that are quite relevant. So if you're in a public four-year college in the U.S., the average six-year graduation, we're giving people, you know, people are on a slower program these days. Um, there's some crowding in schools. And so we're giving you six years to get a degree. Uh, public four years is around 60% actually make it. Private non-for-profit four years around 66%. Now, Berkeley is around 80%. I don't, 82 or 83%. I don't know what Vanderbilt is. I would guess it's probably higher than that. It might even be as high as 90%. Very best elite private schools would be in the 94, 95 range. So there's a lot of room to play with here. And there's a, a very important cautionary tale at the bottom of the slide in red. And that is, <clears throat> what's the six-year graduation rate at private for-profit four-year colleges? Well, it's only 20%. And these colleges have attracted a lot of attention uh, in the last few years, um, because of the slowdown in investment in the public sector in education and the, the fact that many of our elite private schools really haven't expanded very much. So most of those schools, schools like Vanderbilt or Princeton or Harvard really have maybe increased their enrollments a little bit, but not much. The private for-profit sector has stepped in but they've been providing institutions which have extremely poor track record in terms of graduating on average. And what Bleemer's results and other results show is that one really important 
thing that seems to happen is if a student goes from say a school with a 50% college graduation rate to a school with a 70% graduation rate, they're gonna, their, their average graduation rate, their average probability of graduating is gonna rise by almost that same percent. So we, it suggests that what we really need to do and is focus on providing more access to institutions with a proven ability to translate freshmen into bachelor's degrees. Um, we've learned, I think, and I've pointed this out already, but that marginal kids can benefit from college access. I'm, I'm going to highlight, a, shout out a couple of papers here that I think are really compelling and very important evidence in this regard. Um, so Zimmerman has a nice study of the Florida State system. And the Florida State system has a minimum GPA. Uh, so if you don't have a certain GPA, you can't get in. And if you have that GPA, you can. And he shows that barely eligible kids, the, the ones who just barely make it versus the ones who uh, are just barely don't make it, unlucky, there's a 20% gain in their graduation rates by being able to go to Florida State versus being able to go to community college or lesser ranked, uh, in some cases, private colleges in Florida. And a similar study uh, done by these three authors, Goodman, Hurwitz, and Smith, a couple of years later, looking at Georgia state system, again, with the minimum SAT, finds an even larger effect. So both of these results are very consistent with the results from the Texas and um, California results. But here, we're not talking about moving kids to the you know pretty good UCs or to the flagship institution in the University of Texas system. Here we're talking about allowing you access to relatively modest Florida State School or Georgia State School. And in both cases, we're making access to a slot a little further up the ladder possible. And we're showing that that access actually benefits the kids. So I think a, a general conclusion is whatever level of a of in the education system is a student currently is if we could get that student a little further up the ladder we could anticipate them being more likely to graduate and benefiting from that with higher earnings and other outcomes over their lives now there's even evidence that this is same the same thing is true at community colleges uh, so um, jack mountjoy has a study of texas community colleges and there we're looking at the margin between not going to college or going to community college. And he shows that um, using a, a availability of community college um, by zip code, so how close is the nearest community college, many people who are thinking about going to community college really don't have the savings and family resources to go too far and so are gonna live at home. And that really generates a lot of variation, especially in a big state like Texas, uh, in the fractions of kids who uh, appear to be kind of rationed out of going to community college because there isn't one nearby versus uh, actually going to community college. And he shows that kids who choose community college over high school only have about 1.7 years of additional schooling and higher earnings. He also shows that in some cases, the presence of a nearby community college can prevent kids from going to a further uh, four-year college. And so that's a diversion effect that partially offsets the benefit of community college. And that has to be acknowledged in thinking about the design of the system. On average, the benefit is positive, but there is this uh, slight um, diversion effect. And then finally, um, there's a, a, a nice study that was just recently published on a program in the community colleges, community colleges in, in California. This is a program to create uh, RNs, registered nurses, through a community college. Most people think of RNs as people who have a bachelor's degree, but it is possible to become a RN through a um, community college program known as an ADN program. And uh, Graz has a very nice study looking at an oversubscribed community college program where there's admission by lottery. And of course, when economists say something admission by lottery, we've got to study that because at least we'll have a good research design and we'll be able to say for sure uh, that the people who got in and the people who didn't get in were similar, but for the, the turn of the lottery. And uh, Grat shows that this um, program has a huge effect, something like a 60 to 100% internal rate of return. In other words, if you think of putting a dollar into this program, you get something like a dollar 60 to $2 back for every dollar you invest. And then ask a really interesting question, if this is such a great program, why doesn't it expand? What, why is it such a small program that that's oversubscribed? And the answer is 
that the people running the community college really can't afford to expand it because it's pretty expensive. This is one of the most expensive programs they offer at this community college. And they don't get extra resources if they expand this program to cover the cost. So the community college has really perverse incentives to not necessarily expand. In fact, if anything, contract a really beneficial program. So this says two things. This says that, again, this program is taking kids who maybe wouldn't go into an RNA program, but go into a very generic CC program or maybe not finish CC community college. And it's giving them an option to this program, this uh, ADN program, which has a very straight pathway to a pretty good job. And that seems to work very well. Uh, and the kind of kids who are potentially applying for this can benefit from that program. So in a, a very important benefit, but the problem is the sl supply of slots. So let me then uh, conclude with the sort of three main conclusions. Just these are basically what I've tried to, the points I've tried to raise throughout the talk. First of all, in my view, the higher education system in the US took a wrong turn in the 1970s. Uh, men born in the 50s and 60s were less educated than those born in the 1940s. Women stalled. Uh, they're got somewhat uh, back on trend, but still not to the trend that they, you would have thought if you'd looked at uh, evidence from uh, earlier cohorts. As a result of those um, features, the US has lost its advantage relative to the rest of the world um, in terms of college attainment. And we're seeing really high returns to college degrees, indicating that there's not enough college degrees being awarded. We're seeing really high returns, not just to the individuals themselves, but to entire labor markets where those people are concentrated, uh, which suggests to me that um, we really have a lot of indicators that we're underinvesting. I think there's ample evidence that the problem uh, is not that there's low returns for going to college or that people who are not going to college would be the ones to get low returns if they were to go to college, but rather that the problem is a shortage of slots at higher quality colleges and universities. And I want to emphasize that this isn't a situation where we only thing we can do is build more Harvards. Uh, that's not really a feasible strategy. The cost of that is in, in, completely infeasible. Rather, what the, what the evidence suggests is every stage of the better quality institutions could be expanded. So more high quality community college programs, more expansion of the, say, the Florida State and Georgia State programs, more expansion of the better quality uh, state universities like UT Austin or the UCs that I highlighted in Bleemer's study. And I think the evidence is just overwhelming that these investments will pay off, particularly for um, marginal and disadvantaged kids, and that um, we really are missing a huge opportunity by not making that investment. And so with that, I'm going to stop. And I think I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'll be glad to uh, take some questions. All right. Thank you, David. Um, we now have time. We're going to move to the Q&A portion of the talk. Uh, we have an, a number of questions in the queue, but there's still time for people to add more questions. So please feel free to continue submitting them. Uh, the Q&A will be moderated by myself and Professor Russo, the chair of the Department of Economics. And so the first question comes from my colleague in the Department of Economics, Leslie Turner. That question is, uh, recent policy discussions around increasing higher education enrollment and attainment have focused on reducing prices, i.e. free college. It would be great to hear thoughts on whether these are the right policies to be thinking about, especially relative to other uses of public funding. Um, well, I must admit that um, I think that's a little bit of a misplaced emphasis myself. So for, in, for instance, the University of California system has, we have fairly high tuitions for a state university, but we have, and this is true, I think very much across the board uh, in most states, we have a very generous um, tuition policy. So if your uh, family income is below like $80,000, there's basically no tuition cost of going to UCs. And I think, so the, what happens if you, 
with the with the current sets of financial aid that we have, uh, there is actually relatively low cost uh, entry to college and university, even higher quality colleges and universities, for uh, lower income people. Uh, and I think I'm sure that, that this is true. Many many elite universities have extremely generous. Uh, Princeton and Harvard, for instance, basically have need blind admissions and will find a way to get anybody in who can can somehow get in. Um, so I, I think that the problem with that plan is it's uh, throwing away a lot of resources. We basically have to raise money somehow. And I can understand why taxpayers in a state might say, well, look, the major beneficiary of higher education is the person themselves. You're going to go to higher education. You're going to graduate. You're going to get these really high rewards. Why shouldn't you pay some of that? You're going to pay a little bit of it because of uh, you're going to pay higher taxes. But presumably, you could easily afford to pay back some of it. Now, there are some problems on the edges. For instance, these low quality for profit universities with really low graduation rates, they're charging high tuitions. Very few students succeed in those settings. We saw the graduation rates, only 20%. So they're creating a disaster because then they're creating a situation where kids are taking out loans to go to those colleges and they're, we can almost predict they're not gonna succeed. So I think that's a slightly different problem, but I think for many other settings, uh, some combination of the existing financial aid that we have possibly coupled with some kind of forgiveness program for loans would be uh, more sensible. I think we really need to be creative about finding resources. If, if we're gonna invest more in, in the economy, there's so many competing needs. We need to invest more in infrastructure to deal with climate change. We need to, we've got a huge deficit. Uh, there's lots and lots of competing needs. Uh, I don't think we can just say, well, give us more money and make everything free. Uh, that's not a reasonable strategy. Thank you. Uh Professor Card, uh, the next question is from Larry Bartels, and he asks. Oh, hi, Larry. <laughs> Larry was my colleague at Princeton for many years. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, so his question is, uh, what fraction of the raw wage gap between college grads and high school grads is plausibly causal? And what are the differences and characteristics between the two groups that account for the rest? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, what Larry is asking is a, a, a deep question that I and others have worked on in great detail over the last 30 years. He's asking, okay, we see this 80% gap or 50 uh, 80 percentage point gap in earnings between a college grad and a high school grad. Surely some of that would have been reflecting the fact that the, the average college graduate is um, has higher aptitude, all these non-cognitive skills. Maybe they've got family connections that put them into really good businesses. All those features would be more likely to be present among the college grads and the high school grads. So when we see this gap, we can't say that taking somebody and moving them from high school to college is gonna increase their wage by 60%. So there's quite a bit of research. In fact, most of those studies that I highlighted here are of that nature. They're saying, for instance, take a kid, move them from a campus that has a 50% graduation rate to a 70. They're gonna have 20% higher graduation rate. How much is their earnings gonna go up? Well, surprisingly, <laughs> the relative return for those marginal kids is very consistent with the average numbers that I showed in that graph. So this doesn't say that it's true for everybody, but it does suggest that the marginal returns for the people that are moved by these programs are maybe not exactly the same size, but comparable in size to the average returns we see. And that's been a bit of a puzzle, but I think it's a consistent message from the existing research over the last 30 years. Thank you, Thank you David. The next question we have from the Q&A is, uh, why do you think males are not attending college as much as females? 
Well, I have a an ongoing theory that um, men are really dragging down the human race, uh, and probably have caused more trouble than you know women historically. And for, for so there's a lot of you know jokes aside, there's a lot of problems that uh, young men face that seem to get confront that uh, young women are better able to handle. Uh, you can see this as early as uh, everyone knows, I think, who has kids. Boys develop a little bit more slowly than girls. So first grade, second grade, third grade, boys are always behind. Um, boys are much more likely to, to have problems with crime, uh, have problems with um, Actually, I believe most learning disabilities are more prevalent among boys than girls. So there's a lot of differences um, that I, you know, I don't, I'm not qualified to know exactly what the sources of them are. I think boys are uh, just generally less future oriented than girls. That's certainly my experience um, talking to undergrad students for 35 years. Uh, and so I, I think it's easier for them to get off track. Maybe sometimes as a result of that, focus they come up with brilliant insights like two famous college dropouts bill gates and uh, the guy who founded apple steve jobs but you know i i think on average boys are not as good at completing the task <laughs> as girls so I, I think that's just a, a fact thank you uh i have a more open-ended type of question uh from indra neil pie uh, and uh, the question is, do you have an opinion on free public college from an economic perspective? A free public college? Yes. Well, as I said, I think, I think a huge amount of the benefit of higher education accrues to the individual themselves in terms of higher earnings and better careers and so on. And we don't have that progressive an income tax system. And so in order to align the incentives, I think we have to expect people to pay back some of this cost of higher education because they're gonna be the principal beneficiaries. Um, I don't necessarily think that the only contribution of higher education is to individuals earnings like for example the stuff that Enrico Moretti shows that higher educated people are contributing to the overall productivity of their region so and other evidence suggests that uh, higher education leads to improved health and in the United States um, a good chunk of health cost is transferred to the public sector so there are lots of reasons to think that we might want to subsidize education potentially a little bit around the edges, which most countries do. Uh, but whether it should be free, I mean, we basically make K-12 free. Uh, community college is essentially free. Uh, so I, I, I feel like we probably need to raise the revenue and I don't see why one of the sources of revenue shouldn't be the people who are gonna benefit from the program. But I understand that the concerns over access to funds and debt aversion and, and so on are, are issues. And even if a kid thinks that on average, all the kids like them are gonna graduate with, from college and are gonna earn more, any individual kid could have some risk. They could have a health problem when they're in their third year and maybe never complete or never be able to enjoy a full career and they would be stuck with student loans in, in some scenarios. And so that's one of the source, reasons why some countries like Australia have an income contingent loan program. And actually Alan Kruger, my old colleague was a big believer in income contingent loans, which would allow um, some safety net built into the loan system basically. Said, okay, on average, we know you're gonna do well. If you don't do well, you don't have to you know, be burdened for the rest of your life. You just have to pay a certain fraction. I, f I feel that that's a better solution than making it free personally. Not because I don't believe in free stuff. I love free stuff, but because somebody, all, I, I tend to believe I'm, I know this is a, mod, uh, you know, a pre-modern idea that debts have to be paid eventually. So I, I feel like we really have to think of how we're going to get the resources somehow. Our next question is, if we invest more money in education, where would that money come from and how would it 
need, how would it need to be used to effectively boost education trends you highlight in the talk? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I think an extremely good question. Um, I think some could be generated from um, students themselves in some settings. Um, we have lots of innovative ways in higher education to finance it. For instance, in the United, in the United States, a huge fraction of higher education is being financed by out-of-state tuition paid by foreign students. So we're generating extra revenue that way. That might not be the most efficient way to generate revenue because we're also giving up a slot when we give a slot to an out-of-state student, an international student, for example. So I think we need to think about all those programs. Um, I'm not really an expert on uh, progressivity of the tax system and what the optimal tax rate would be. My perception is, my reading of the evidence is that tax rates these days are lower than they have been uh, and that we're gonna have to increase taxes at some, some level or cut spending. And I don't think we should be cutting spending on education, but I think that's really a, a huge political argument that is not going to be resolved by any, you know, somewhat uninformed advice that I would give. So I think I should stop there before I uh, put my foot in my mouth. Thank you, Professor Carr. Uh, the, the next question is from Tucker Smith, one of our PhD students in economics. Right. Uh, I met him earlier today, actually. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, you spoke about the high returns for marginal students, but a related literature has found limited effects of financial aid in inducing marginal students to enroll in two or four year college. What do you think is the best approach to increasing enrollment and attainment? Well, I, I agree. That's actually a good point, Tucker has raised. It doesn't look like the, uh, the, the big and biggest obstacle to going to college for certain people is the cost. There is maybe some convincing evidence that raising tuition does cause some reduction in college going, but it's surprisingly hard to get solid evidence on that and the effects are relatively small. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. One I alluded to before, which is uh, anybody who runs a college knows if you raise the price, the sticker, so-called sticker price of tuition, lots and lots of people don't pay the sticker price. Uh, and so we can try, when we try and study how does financial aid in one place affect uh, going to school, we have to remember that if I give a student more financial aid, they might end up having higher costs because now they're going to be, uh, if the, the person who's previously given them some other source of financial aid or lower tuition is going to adjust. So there's a, the system is very, very complicated. And if you change the parameters at one point, other changes down the, through the system can make it appear, especially for some poor kid from you know some town that doesn't necessarily have a sophisticated understanding can say, well, I got this financial aid, but I'm still paying about the same out of pocket at the end of the day. And that's a very common problem that you see. A second thing is I think um, there are other types of access that really do matter. For instance, geographic proximity. Having a college nearby, Jack Montjoy studies the community colleges in Texas shows very, very strongly that nearby having a college nearby really makes a big difference. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but most, maybe one, the most obvious one is you get to live at home. And that's a pretty socially efficient way to do things. In fact, that's the way most countries have higher education. Most countries, even you know, Germany, Switzerland, France, most people go to their local school. And even in the US, that's true to the majority of people. So making that, making a college is closer to home so you could live with your mom, dad, or whatever, uh, brother and sister, share the cost can make a huge difference, I think. And it, it also may have some salience in people's minds. They say, well, there's a college here. I know what my target is. So with our limited attention, uh, we can, you know, I'm 11th grader. I don't quite know what I'm going to do, but I have in sight that college is nearby. That I think might be part of it as well. So I think there is evidence that some kinds of access do matter, for instance, geographic access. Financial access, I agree um, with Tucker, doesn't look like there's a big effect. The next question comes from my colleague, Andrew Dustin, who asks, 
why aren't high quality private schools increasing supply? The incentives seem to be there. I don't think that's true, Andrew. I think the problem is um, that elite universities lose money on their marginal students. So uh, in fact, I think the, the elite universities are benefiting from keeping supply constrained. Many, many colleges, for instance, have programs to try and get more people to apply because they're going to get a higher rating. <laughs> but then by not re accepting them, <laughs> right? So if you want to, so this is a, a very peculiar example of a, of a, of a product that, that higher education is selling that gets some of its value from scarcity. Uh, so I, I think that I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that a high quality university at say at the level of, um, Vanderbilt can actually increase student slots at a profitable level. I think that's an interesting question, but I don't think it's true. I think that the marginal cost of a student may be above what you can actually get on the margin for expanding those slots. When you take all things into consideration, like what it's going to do to your financial aid package, what it's going to do to your um, costs and of supplying the dorms and the the beautiful library facilities like are shown behind me on this screen and so on. Thank you. Uh, next question is from my colleague Andrea Moro uh, and he asked uh, states it is difficult for causal identification research design to identify general equilibrium effects Increasing college entry may significantly affect returns. The parameters are correctly identified, but if the policy implication is applied in a large scale, the results are subject to a Lucas critique. Yet in labor economics, we don't hear much discussion about this issue. What can researchers do to address this critique? Uh, I think that's a, I think that's a fair criticism of a lot of labor economics research, including quite a bit of my own research. Um, I think people are working on that margin. That's certainly a frontier. Um, for instance, uh, Bleemer's study of the of the of the four percent program. One of the things he does is looks at the people who were squeezed out of the system. So when UC San Diego admits a bunch of kids who get in from the 4% program, it actually has to reduce the number of kids and let in another ways. And so there are ways to develop models of that. There's always a lot of um, unknown parameters, which um, have to be, I believe the term is calibrated. <laughs> so there's a lot of, in, in any full model of the economy, there's a lot of parts that we really don't fully understand and it's gonna be a matter of judgment and experience and convention as to how those parameters are filled in and how that part of the model is built up. But I think there is a recognition, especially in the higher ed area that that needs to be taken into consideration. I'm not so worried about the evidence on the, um, uh, aggregate or general equilibrium effects of higher education. And here's why, the Moretti study. The Moretti study says, if anything, um, more college educated workers are probably a positive externality to the labor market. And I think, so in that case, it means that if we set them to zero and uh, you know look at everything from the partial equilibrium point of view, we're probably going to, if anything, understate the benefits of education. So we've received a, a few questions about the nature of the uh, college premium, uh, about the nature of uh, what a degree provides, uh, specifically with respect to whether it's being driven by human capital. Uh, so the, uh, the nature of the, what you learn in the degree itself versus signaling, just letting the labor market know you have a, a degree. What percentage of the returns to education can be assigned to, to each? Yeah, I don't think there's really good evidence on that. I mean, here's some ways to think about that. Um, at the individual level, it's it's almost impossible to tell those two apart because at the individual level, I go to a better college, I graduate, now I have a degree from Berkeley versus I had a degree from 
Cal State Sacramento. That, as far as I, as far as we can measure, that individual has that higher quality degree. We can see something there. The one way that we might be able to tell if it's all signaling is again this Moretti style evidence where we say, okay, if it's all signaling, then when you increase the number of graduates in a local labor market, the average return per graduate should go down, uh, not go up. And, it, and again, to the best of my knowledge, all of the evidence suggests that goes up. And there's a big international literature on the, the growth effects of education. Actually, Alan Kruger again wrote a very fundamental paper in this area, sort of saying, look, is there really a big problem with signaling? If there's really a bit, if that's what's really going on, then when you increase human capital in the whole economy, it won't necessarily have a positive effect. It's just redistributing the pie. What does the evidence look like? I think the general perception is the evidence suggests that the returns are fairly decent at the aggregate level. And some of the, um, some of the uh, biggest experiments in this area are market level experiments like big improvements in education systems from historical perspectives that occurred in certain places, certain provinces of Canada or parts of the US. And I think those almost always show pretty big returns, not these um, uh, zero returns, which would be suggested by uh, uh, a pure signaling story. But I think it has to be acknowledged that none of that evidence is decisive. So that's a, a question that you know we'll probably be talking about forever. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, a PhD student in our department, Andrew Rollins, uh, and he uh, asks, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the UC system dropped the requirement of SAT, ACT scores for their fall 2021 and 2022 admissions. Do you think phasing out certain quantitative metrics such as test scores and college admissions will increase the prevalence of accusations of discrimination in admissions? Ah, well, that's a good question. I um, I think the major challenge that's going to be facing people that are getting UCs are, are not using SATs, but a lot of other schools are not using SATs this year as well. And I think the problem that they're running into is <laughs> great inflation at high school. So that, frankly speaking, there's a lot of students with very, very, very good, almost perfect GPAs, and no one quite knows what to do about that. How sh how can you uh, address that concern? I'm aware of a, a version of this, an extreme version of this is, I, I think I'm, I might have mentioned earlier, the Canadian system. In, in the province where I grew up in Ontario, the way the education system, higher education system works is, is at the end of your 12th grade, you, there's a, in 12th grade, you take a bunch of classes, sort of standardized classes like calculus, physics, English, French, whatever. And those are uh, standardized exams, but they're, they're graded by the individual teacher. So they're standardized courses, but, but individual exams, excuse me, I misspoke that. So there is a, then, then every high school has some incentive to inflate their grades so that their kids get into college. Because that's the only information college uh, people have to let you in. And there is a concern that it has led to great inflation. The colleges have responded by uh, applying high school specific discount factors. So that's a possible concern. I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I know, for instance, in um, elite in, uh, admissions programs like Harvard or whatever, they put some uh, emphasis on standardized tests and some on GPA and some on, on um, uh, AP courses and some on other types of evidence of academic achievement. So I think that's going to be a difficult thing that get, get, gets worked out. I, I'm not exactly sure how it's all going to come down. But the big problem and concern I know is is how do we um, address differences across high schools and grading standards and actually we face that in economics in college I don't know if this is true of Vanderbilt but at Berkeley economics is one of the hardest graders 
and we we pride ourselves in um, our low grades, <laughs> which uh, is somewhat frustrating for our poor students because they say, well, why should I take like that advanced class in e economics where I'm going to get if I really, really do well, I might be able to get a B plus or A minus, whereas if I work like that in this class, I'll get my A plus. So I, I think this is a problem in the whole system. Thank you. On behalf of the Department of Economics and Vanderbilt University, I'd like to thank Professor David Card for his excellent contribution to the Stein Lecture Series. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us here today, and I hope to see you all at a future event. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks very much.